Okay, so the, we will start. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, welcome to uh, uh, the uh, the May uh, the uh, Innovation Radiology Grand Rounds. So it's, it's our uh, distinct uh, the honor, a pleasure to have uh, Dr. Roy Herbst uh, here uh, for today. Uh, he is the uh, Ensing uh, Professor of uh, Medicine uh, in the Medical Oncology and a Professor of Pharmacology. Uh, he's the uh, uh, the the Chief of uh, Medical Oncology here at Yale, uh, the, as well as Associate Director of uh, Translational Research and uh, DART, uh, the Disease Aligned Research uh, Team Leader of the Thoracic Oncology at uh, uh, Yale Cancer Center. Uh, the, uh, he uh, um, was uh, trained here, uh, as well as Cornell, Rockefeller, then uh, Brigham, uh, and the Dana Farber Cancer Center. Before returning back to Yale, uh, he was the uh, Chief of uh, Thoracic Oncology at the uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, amongst many, many, many uh, the accomplishments, I think that uh, he uh, has been the pioneer of a modern day uh, immunotherapy, uh, particularly for lung cancer. Uh, so he will discuss uh, the journey of uh, immunotherapy and the lung cancer treatments uh, with us. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Kevin. It's really uh, great to be here uh, to talk to everyone. Um, as you'll see, radiology is so vital to, of course, our clinical care, but, but our research as well. And one of my goals, I know Kevin shares this with me, is to try to integrate even more together and, 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 and collaborate in, uh, in the obtaining of tissue, the diagnosis and, and measurement of, of response and resistance. So I'll show you a little bit about that today. And I'll take you about, on a little journey um, in, in lung cancer. So um, the treatment of lung cancer has changed dramatically. I'm sure most of you have seen this during the course of your career. There was a time if you had metastatic lung cancer, there really was almost nothing to do. It was, um, uh, you know, which chemotherapy do you give? And the median survival was, uh, for all patients, uh, about 10 months. Um, things changed around 15 or so years ago with the advent of the so-called targeted therapies, agents that target uh, driver pathways, uh, for example, epidermal growth factor receptor, and that led to a whole era of uh, personalizing uh, care for lung cancer where biopsy was important. There was a time when in lung cancer diagnosis we just have an FNA perhaps and, and really very little tissue for analysis. But, um, and this is a slide from a paper we published when I was at MD Anderson. We worked with the interventional team there, Marshall Hicks and Sanjay Gupta, who very early on collaborated with us. Of course, they had a large number of uh, tables and, and, and resources there. But really, with very strong uh, radiology collaboration, we, we did a trial, and I'll show you just very briefly some of it. You can look it up if you want to see more details. We had 450, 500 biopsies on consecutive lung cancer patients, and we used that biopsy to treat them. Uh, that helped, and uh, you know, people um, are, are being treated now. I'll show you some of these data with some of these new drugs. But now, in 2017, uh, everything's about immunotherapy. I think both approaches are complementary. Um, using the immune system to target cancer. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that today with a bit of an update. It is, is amazing. It really works. Um, there are limitations, and I think we're perfectly suited here at Yale to figure that out. And now the biomarkers don't just involve the tumor. They involve the microenvironment. So that's a challenge. How are we going to uh, you know, get uh, enough biopsy, enough tissue, not only to see the tumor cells, but enough stroma so that we can uh, uh, assess the microenvironment? So here's what I plan to do today, talk a little bit about new drug development for advanced lung cancer, uh, novel clinical trial designs for biomarker development, and uh, those are these battle trials, which I'll show you. Then a bit about immunotherapy, uh, really a new standard for care, and then bringing it all together, I'll show you how we're, we're using biopsies in our clinical trials. So lung cancer, uh, number one cause of cancer death worldwide. Uh, in the U.S., over 200,000 new cases a year. 13% of all cancer cases, uh, over 150,000 deaths. 27% of all cancer deaths in the U.S. this year will be from lung cancer. Worldwide, I think these numbers probably underestimate the numbers, given uh, the prevalence of this in countries like uh, China, for example. But uh, estimated about 1.8 million new cases with 1.6 million deaths. 80% of lung cancer is non-small cell. 13% is small cell. Um, Non-small cell lung cancer uh, is smoking related about 80% of the time. There is, of course, a very distinct non-smoker's lung cancer, mostly the driver mutations I, I mentioned earlier. 
And 13% uh, is small cell. Small cells are always uh, associated with smoking, as I'm sure many of you know. 42.1 million adults in the U.S. are currently smoking. That's 18%. There's a large uh, effort here to, to work on that with, with messaging, with pharmacology, uh, and other programs uh, making some success. Well, um, the field really changed uh, about, uh, as I said, 10 to 14, 14, 10 to 14 years ago with the, uh, with the uh, use of epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitors. So it would be at one time that lung cancer was basically treated with chemotherapy, attack dividing cells, great deal of toxicity. And then, of course, the, uh, it became obvious that the epidermal growth factor receptor was overexpressed in, in lung cancer. You can find more of it on, 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 on many of the epithelial tumors, lung cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer. So lung cancer was, of course, uh, one of the first uh, cancers where we tested a drug back then called ZD1839 or gefitinib. Uh, trade name ERISA, and uh, of course, you know, we, we now know that, you know, the, the receptor, the epidermal growth factor receptor, external domain, transmembrane domain, internal tyrosine kinase domain, has specific mutations in exons 19 and 21, and uh, when you use these drugs, they compete for ATP in the binding site quite, quite well, and, and actually uh, halt the growth of tumors, uh, actually you see apoptosis and, and death, um, toxicities uh, being, as you would expect, skin and GI. Um, but this really revolutionized how we, how we think of lung cancer, the, these drugs. Uh, this is a picture from about 10 years ago. Um, you can't tell which of these people is the, the patient with lung cancer. Uh, it's actually Cecily here. She, she was for nine years. Uh, she was on an epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitor. And, uh, you know, she came in widely metastatic disease, you know, multiple prior therapies, and she went on a clinical trial. Uh, this is actually before we even learned about the mutation. Mutations were learned about because many people were treated, biopsies were obtained, and then sequencing was done. And she was featured uh, by an article, Tara Parker Pope, who used to write for the Wall Street Journal. Now, of course, she does a column for the New York Times. Why curing your cancer may not be the best idea. What was meant by this is cancer is not cured with these drugs, but people live with these drugs. They take a pill once a day, and, and the disease is stable. The, the, the problem, of course, is drug resistance, as I'll show you in, in the next slide. So here's the, the newest uh, iteration of epidermal growth factor inhibition. This is a drug called osimertinib. Um, it was just approved about six months ago, um, and it's, it's actually used for patients with epidermal growth factor receptor mutation who already have resistance with a second mutation known as T790M. And the reason I show this to you is the only way we know that the patients have a second mutation is we have to re-biopsy. This is why you're seeing so many biopsies from our lung cancer patients, because when someone has an epidermal growth factor receptor mutation and is treated, the median time to progression, even with these great new drugs, is still about a year. So, you know, for those half of the patients who start to grow out a year, we'll, we'll biopsy them, and then we'll treat with this new generation drug and look at this, this response. So this is a waterfall uh, plot. This is the way we've been looking at this in the last uh, several years, where re uh, response, growth, uh, these are resist criteria, which we appreciate that, that you do for us. And you can see just a wonderful response. You know, 61% of patients had a response. So that's the good news. The bad news is, um, uh, I guess it didn't show up, the bad news is no one's really cured. We're going to have to continue to find new drugs for these patients because you start the new drug, the tumors will learn to evolve in a Darwinian way and, 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 and become resistant. So with this therapy in lung cancer, we're seeing great responses, great symptom relief, many fewer uh, side effects than we see with chemotherapy, but everyone will eventually uh, progress, uh, unfortunately, with this disease. So we're making progress, though, and this is just a, uh, you know, a, if you want to uh, see a good review, this is a, two years ago, Katie Pilletti and I, uh, you know, put this volume together for clinical cancer research, and it really is incredible in the last 10 years, all the advances that have been seen, including the targeted therapies and the immunotherapies that I'll tell you about uh, before I'm done. Well, with that as a little bit of background, how can we do better? So we know about epidermal growth factor receptor. We know there's another mutation called ALK, anaplastic lymphoma kinase. The epidermal growth factor receptor mutation in the U.S. population, about 10 to 15 percent. The ALK, about 5 percent. But what about the other 80 percent? What could we do? So we, uh, as I said, when I was at MD Anderson, one of the things that really frustrated us is that we didn't have tissue. You know, and we couldn't figure this out in a molecular way because when we looked at the tissue that we had available to study lung cancer, it really was mostly from surgical resections. So that's, that's great, but when we're treating someone in the advanced setting, they've already had chemotherapy, they've had radiation therapy. 
So whatever is left growing here is probably resistant to all of that. But no one was doing new biopsies. It wasn't done. It wasn't uh, reimbursed. Um, doctors didn't want to recommend it. Patients, of course, didn't want to have it. So the culture had to change. So we um, actually, this would have been around 2000 and, and, um, and uh, four. Uh, at MD Anderson, we, uh, we were very fortunate. Uh, we were part of a large Department of Defense grant uh, to study lung cancer uh, in Texas. Uh, and we actually put in, uh, you know, I think it was about a $20 million grant to pay for biopsies, to pay for analysis. The idea being, we would develop a trial where we would get biopsies on all patients, uh, core, core needle biopsies, and then use those biopsies to then treat the patients in the most effective way. So that was uh, a program uh, known as BATO, and uh, you know, it was a true collaboration between uh, interventional radiology at Anderson, our, our medical oncology group, our statistical group, our pathology group, and that stood for biomarker-based approaches of targeted therapy for lung cancer elimination. We like the word BATO. Uh, I guess the elimination is a little bit, you know, uh, optimistic, but you know, we, we really wanted to focus, you know, on, on, on how can we best treat uh, lung cancer. It was a platform for integrated research with a clinical trial design I'll show you uh, in a novel way and to discover new biomarkers, because the only way you're going to discover biomarkers is if you look for them. And there were three hypotheses to this uh, trial. Real-time biopsies were possible to more accurately reflect aberrant signaling in lung cancer. So that, that, you know, we all say, wow, of course, that wasn't established 10 years ago. Matching targeted agents with abnormal pathways will improve disease control in lung cancer patients. We used as our endpoint in this trial eight-week disease control. Is the patient stable or, 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 or responding at, at eight weeks versus progressing? Sadly, in lung cancer, that, that, that does correlate with outcome, and uh, that's shown here. So here's the way we did this, and um, it was rather unique at its time. Now there, there are many trials that are, that are doing this in many tumor types, which I'm happy to see. It was what we call an umbrella protocol. So anyone coming into to Houston at that time, and that was, it's a big center. It's about five to ten times bigger than our center, uh, uh, at least in the lung cancer arena. As patients would come in, we'd say, okay, are you a candidate you know, for this trial? The requirements were quite broad. Refractory lung cancer, meaning you had at least one prior chemotherapy. You have a performance status that's good. It didn't have to be great. We, we called it about 50% or more, zero to two. Uh, there is a certain selection bias you get at a, at a center like MD Anderson where people have to fly in and come from a distance. So by the very nature, you get a slightly better patient you know, physically. And what we said is they had to be a candidate for biopsy. So it created a whole new you know, era, and, and I think it's done now, but it wasn't then. But the first thing we did was, you know, and this was just, you know, things were just becoming electronic, we'd call the radiologist and say, can you biopsy this? You know, you know it sounds trivial now, but, but we, we worked very closely with our colleagues, and we wanted to be able to get a core on, on all these patients, an 18-gauge core. Um, so we would get the core, and then within two weeks, we would get a biopsy on all these patients, and we would send the patients for a biomarker profile. And if you're going to do biomarker-based therapy, you have to have the results, biopsy, results, treatment within a couple of weeks, especially when the median survival in refractory lung cancer was about five to six months. So we did that, and we, we, we obtained markers for epidermal growth factor. I've already told you about that. KRAS, I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. 20 to 25 percent of lung adenocarcinomas, usually smoking-related. Chemotherapy has almost no effect vascular endothelial growth factor, angiogenesis, and here's RxR, cyclin D1, so we're looking at cell cycle, uh, rexenoids, and, uh, uh, you know, involved in, in cell cycle and, and, and growth, and, and the way we did this is we initially randomized our patients to these four, to four arms, an EGFR inhibitor, a VEGF inhibitor, an RxR inhibitor, bexarotene plus an EGFR inhibitor, or serafinib, which we thought would work against KRAS. And uh, the way we did this is we first equally randomized the patients, and then once we had an idea how patients were doing on each arm, we used what's called adaptive uh, uh, randomization. Don't have time to really go through that in detail. I'll refer you to our, our paper for that. Basically, the way that works is as you learn how patients are doing on each of the arms, uh, you have an algorithm which will, more, will still randomize the patients, but randomize them in a more of a skewed way so that more of them will go to the arm that benefits. So it's important because we're learning, but we also want to help patients and give them the, the best possible therapy at the same time. Well, um, we, we learned a great deal from this. Here's, here's the reference, Kim et al., Cancer Discovery, Discovery 2011, also a follow-up paper in the JNCI by Nathan Eiley in 2012. But what we found from that is we looked at different biomarkers, and here's EGFR mutation, and that correlated with outcome for erlotinib. 
Now, these days, of course, you say, of course, but it wasn't, it wasn't proven back then, and you can see positively associated. Here's a drug, vendetinib, which you may know it's used for medullary thyroid cancer. It never quite made it for lung cancer, at least not yet. But in the patients that had high VEGFR2, so vascular endothelial growth factor receptor on their tumor, there was actually a positive outcome as well. And we're actually still using this now as we do more clinical trials with anti-angiogenic agents. So this trial showed us that tissue was important. You need to get tissue. And, and we also um, actually found some interesting patterns. You can see there are clearly two patterns here. What this is showing us is that the type of KRAS mutation you have, whether uh, the, in codon 12 you either have uh, change to a cysteine uh, or a valine versus anything else in, in, in pink, you can see two different patterns of downstream activation. This is a transcriptional analysis. Why is this important? Because if you understand the biology, it can help us treat better. We actually have a battle two trial. We actually did this here at Yale uh, when, I, when I arrived. This is, was an NCI-sponsored uh, R01. Um, again, you know, detail's not as important as just the concept. Again, biopsies on all patients. The thing that I'm very proud of is we did it here. Uh, it was very funny because I, I left Anderson and I, I wanted to bring the program here. And uh, they said, oh, you won't be able to do this here. And uh, I said, of course we can. And, and actually, uh, working with a, a number of you in this room, we actually set up a, a program where we had 45 biopsies on, on patients and enrolled them in this trial. This paper just came out in JCO. Here we were looking at KRAS mutational status as our marker, but then we were learning and we were actually using combination targeted therapies. So here, here's the lessons that we learned from the battle program. Core biopsies are feasible and safe, and you know, we ask you to do these all the time, and, and I, I, I'm sure you would agree. Biomarker results can be obtained in, in less than two weeks, and in some cases, even, even better. The limitation is when someone comes in from the outside and the tissue hasn't been obtained here, that's the biggest problem, you know, finding it and getting it. Drugs can be obtained from multiple companies and used in a trial. That's what we need to do. It, it's all well and good to have a biopsy and know what's driving a tumor, but if you can't find a drug, it's not going to help that patient. We use this adaptive randomization technique, as I mentioned, and we could accrue. So we did over 600 patients uh, in, in Houston on the first trial, but in the second trial, which was about 200, we had about a quarter of the patients here, and that was about two or three times that they thought we would get, and uh, probably could have even done more. This was two, three years ago. Now, now the program's even larger. So we, this is team science. So um, you know, uh, here's just uh, here's the here's the MD Anderson team uh, shown here, and MD Anderson. This was led by Wan Ki Hang, who's so one of the uh, uh, the historic figures in lung cancer research, and this is John Minna, who we collaborated with. He's at UT Southwestern. Um, uh, um, Dr. Kim, who I mentioned, and now here's our Yale team, you know, just in the office across the hall, and the key people, uh, the radiologists were probably busy, so they're not in the picture, but, you know, here's, here's Jeff Sklar and David Rim, who work very closely with us, Rocco, uh, Peter Ku, Emily Duffield in the clinic. So that's the future, biopsies, precision medicine. So then we said, well, if we can do it, you know, at a couple of sites, why can't we do it all across the country? So we developed uh, what we call the master protocol, and right around 2010, the Institute of Medicine, now called the National Academy of Medicine, said, wouldn't it be nice if we could uh, uh, innovate in a cl clinical trials in the United States where they can have improved speed and efficiency, have innovative science and trial design, improve prioritization, support, and completion of trials, and incentivize participation. And actually, they looked at the battle trial as one example of that type of approach, tissue-based trials. So um, two committees uh, uh, came together in 2011, 2012. The NCI Thoracic Malignancy Steering Committee, that was chaired by Dr. Fred Hirsch, and a group called Friends of Cancer Research at the Brookings Institute, which I'm sure many of you have heard about, they created a, a white paper, which I shared, and the idea was how could we do a master protocol in lung cancer to get tissue and then use that tissue to treat patients. And again, it's based on what I just told you. Back in 1984 or early on, you know, sort of when I was training in, in fellowship a little after this, Really, all we had for lung cancer was we knew about KRAS. By the way, we still know about KRAS, and we can't do anything about that. So that's a good, good, good project for anyone that's looking for one. And then, you know, around 2004, I mentioned we learned about EGFR. And then uh, because we started getting tissue, the field accelerated. And now there are about eight or nine different drivers in lung cancer, EGFR, KRAS, BRAF, HER2, PI3 kinase, ALK. And now in 2016, even a few more. And the thing that's interesting, if you look at lung squamous carcinoma, which is about 30 to 40 percent of the lung cancers, you can see from the tumor genome atlas that there are, there are mutations 
I don't know how well you can see this, but basically, for example, here's, here's uh, uh, PI3 kinase, and you can see there are mutations at 16% rate. So if we could, the, the hypothesis was if we can find those patients who have the mutations and treat them with PI3 kinase inhibitors, maybe they'll benefit. Maybe their tumors will shrink. Maybe they'll live longer. But, you know, I can't do that trial here as a single investigator just taking random patients. We'll never find them. We need some sort of mass umbrella. We need a funnel to find these patients. And that's where biopsies and profiling comes to play. So we decided to do the ultimate umbrella protocol, and that, that's what we call the squamous lung master protocol. This was going to be a protocol across the entire United States, bringing together sites at all centers, uh, academic but also community. 90% of oncology patients are treated in the community, not, at, not down in Cedar Street or not in New York City. So we have to get the profiling, we have to get the analysis, we have to get the drugs to these people. So that's, that's the protocol. It's called S1400, the lung map protocol, a biomarker-driven master protocol for previously treated squamous cell lung cancer, or lung map. And the overall goal is to quickly identify and test new targeted treatments and immunotherapies for squamous lung cancer, and if effective, move these to FDA approval. So it was a trial that was designed to get drugs approved if they worked. So this was actually a, 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 a wonderful project to be involved with, and I was very fortunate to co-chair the steering committee and to be the, uh, the, the national PI on this study. And basically, this was what we call a public-private partnership. It's what was um, sort of, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the 21st Century Cures Bill last year that went through Congress, but that's, this was one of the provisions there to, to bring the NCI and to bring the uh, the academic centers together with industry, because that's where the drugs are going to come. And, uh, you know, since the industry is developing their drugs, we might as well ask them to help support the trial. So what we did is we, we have the master protocol, and we have, these are the, the five cooperative groups, the groups that, you know, meet, you know, on a uh, bi uh, twice a year basis uh, to, to develop clinical trials for lung cancer, SWAG, Alliance, their names keep changing, NRG, uh, the NCI of Canada. And then we have these groups on the outside, um, the National Cancer Institute, of course. The foundation for the National Cancer Institute is actually uh, a, a, a 501c3 that actually works with the NCI. That's where all the private money can come in. So all the industry money can come into this corporation that then funnels the money to the NCI. The Friends of Cancer Research, led by Ellen Siegel, have been very influential on this product. And while the FDA can't be officially involved, they guide us because we're developing trials so that if it works, the drugs can get approved and be available to even more people. So we tried to focus on squamous lung cancer, and as I told you, there are actionable mutations, or at least we hypothesized that there were actionable mutations or amplifications. However, the numbers are, are sort of small. So in order to do a reasonable trial to test something that's at 5%, you know, you, know, you, know, you screen, uh, you know, that, you, know you, 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 you have to screen 20 patients to get a couple. So, so we actually, you know, were able to get several hundred you know, patients because we, we screened, you know, throughout the United States. Here's the partners, and notice the partners are both the cooperative groups, the NCI. We did all of our profiling and foundation medicine. We took competitive bids, and this group up in Cambridge was the one that came in with the best pro program and best price, and of course, working with the industry, because that's who's providing us the drugs, and actually, we have them help pay for the trial. And, and it's a win-win, because this trial, if we can find them the patients, they would never find if they had a trial with 10 sites. They're not going to find 100 patients with a 5% mutation rate uh, abnormality. And also, it's a little cheaper because they're all sort of, all the companies are cooperating in a sort of a pre-competitive way. And, you know, we have lots of meetings. This is the Chicago airport. And, you know, it's one of these, you know, big collaborations. So it's a multi-arm master protocol. You want to have homogenous patient populations and constant eligibility. Everyone on this trial got a biopsy, and the biopsy was paid for the, for the trial. So I'm sure some of you in this room have done biopsies for this trial. Certainly many of you have read the x-rays for the patients on this trial. Um, if a patient had an old biopsy, we allowed it to be used, but many of these patients were getting new biopsies. In many places around the country, biopsies were not paid for. Patients didn't have insurance. It didn't matter. We had the money for the biopsy. And it, most of the biopsies were cores, but we did also allow bronchoscopy as well. Each arm of this trial is independent of this, uh, the others. I'll show you how this works. Infrastructure facilitates opening new arms faster. It was a phase 2-3 design, which allowed for rapid drug dry marker testing. If something looked good, it moved to phase 3. We screened large numbers of patients for multiple targets. Uh, we want to try to engage physicians and patients. I want a trial so that when I see someone on SMILO4 and they come in, anyone can go on this trial. We get the biopsy. We have something to offer anyone, no matter what their, their result, to bring safe and effective drugs to patients faster. And we wanted to facilitate FDA approval. 
So here's how it worked. Patient came in. Um, you know, Yale actually, we're one of the top accruing sites, even though we're not the biggest site. And actually, our VA hospitals done incredibly well with uh, Herder Chow and Michal Rose. And they're part of the VIN, I think it's the VIN 9, where they, they're all working together in the VA system. So a lot of, a lot of uh, Yale involvement. So basically, patients come in. Uh, we, we get the biopsy. It goes to Foundation Medicine for testing. And then we have different mutations we're looking for. So they either can have, you know, we initially we had uh, hepatocyte growth factor, FGF receptor, CDK4-6, of course, cell cycle, PI3 kinase. And then this was about 40, 50%. Then we had a non-MAX arm. The non-MAX arm patients got immunotherapy. This is an immunotherapy. I'll tell you about that in the final part of my talk. And the other patients each got a drug that we selected through a very rigorous process to target that abnormality. And uh, we learned, and this drug actually dropped out early on because the company was developing this drug in gastric cancer, and that those trials failed. So we, we lost one of the arms. But again, they're all modular. No one of these arms is critically linked to the next. And then actually, we found that it was very hard to randomize patients to, 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 to control. Uh, we couldn't do randomized trials. Why? Because immunotherapy became approved for lung cancer. So very few patients wanted to go on to this trial and be randomized to standard chemotherapy. But that's okay. We just did single arm trials. And what the FDA told us is if you saw response rates above 30 40% with any of these arms, it could still get an accelerated approval. So here's the trial as it exists uh, right now. Um, you get the biopsy, and we, we're doing plenty of these here at Yale. A lot of them, a lot of patients at our care centers, too, which I'm very happy to see. They either have a biomarker or they're non-matched. If they have a biomarker, there are three arms, PI3 kinase, uh, uh, CDK4-6, or FGF receptor. We have a PI3 kinase inhibitor from Genentech, uh, Pablocycate, a CDK4-6 inhibitor from Pfizer, and AZD4547, an FGF receptor inhibitor from AstraZeneca, and the patient then gets gets one of these drugs in a randomized uh, setting, if it, in a single arm setting, and if it looks good, then we randomize. And for those patients who don't have a biomarker, they, these patients get immunotherapy. The detail is not important as the concept, and I just want to stress how important the biopsy is in this trial, both for assigning the patient, and then think of the resources we have to go back now to query that database as we see outcome. We have one of the largest databases uh, available. And uh, the trial continues to grow. We've just added a, a PARP inhibitor. Some of you are probably, there's a big, big group here at Yale interested in DNA repair. Uh, so the, the trial keeps growing. So again, just for those who, if I, if I went too fast, patients register. They come in the door. They either have tissue, but most of them don't. So we, we get the biopsy. It's paid for. We call uh, your team up. Uh, and then we, we, we get the biopsy. We can either uh, get the biopsy when they come in and they're progressing. But now we have the option when they're getting their frontline therapy, since we know that no one with lung cancer is cured with chemotherapy, we can get the biopsy at that time so that it's ready to go at the time that they progress. And then they either get a biomarker-driven sub-study or a non-max study. This has just been a wonderful uh, success. These are all the sites around the country that have this trial open, 700-plus um, sites. We even have Canada open. Um, over 300 sites have at least one patient. I uh, wonder why, what the other sites are doing, but that's, that's the way things work with clinical trials. Uh, well over 1,000 patients, uh, seven, 307 were registered to a sub-study. So we're, we're getting patients on these arms, and we're answering the questions. Does a PI3 kinase inhibitor work when you have that mutation? I'll tell you that the initial results I'm seeing are it probably doesn't, but still important because it tells us to move on to the next target or to a combination of targets. And that's really uh, how this works. It's a big funnel. You know, you have high accruing sites, you're recruiting new participants, we're providing support to sites around the country. Um, so this is, this is really the goal of, of translational research. Find the patients with the abnormalities, match them to the drugs, and, you know, this funnel is large because the mutation percentages are small, but radiology and biopsies are so critical to this process, as I'm sure you know. So with that, now I'm going to spend the, the last part of the talk telling you about immunotherapy, which I know many of you are familiar with, but um, uh, I'll be basic at the beginning, then I'll tell you about some of the research studies at the end. Lung cancer, melanoma, uh, bladder cancer, these are all tumors with high mutational rates. They're all smoking-related cancers. Well, melanoma is the sun, but n right after you have the sun, you've got all the smoking-related cancers, and this is number of mutations per megabase. So mutations with high mutational rate, you would think would be uh, good, good sites for the immune system to, to target. And uh, if you look at colorectal cancer, look at the variation you have in colorectal cancer. 
Uh, and you know, see this group right up here? Those are the those are the patients that are MSI high, mismatch repair high, you know, with mismatch deficiency genes, and those patients in colorectal cancer who have those high mutational burdens, they do very well uh, with responses to immunotherapy. How does immunotherapy work? Um, basically, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very simple concept uh, on one hand, but incredibly complicated if you really want to dig in. So from the simple point of view, just think of it this way. You have the tumor cell and you have the T cell. And the tumor cell, of course, presents the neoantigen um, in the context of self. So here's MHC presenting the neoantigen, the mutation, to the T cell receptor. When I took immunology at Yale a really long time ago, this, is, this was known and I learned this. Everything else is new. So you have to sort of relearn immunology for those who have trained um, uh, a while back. So, but we knew that when the tumor cell and the T cell interact, that through the T cell receptor, that, that stimulates the growth uh, the, and proliferation of the T cell through these signal transduction pathways shown here. However, what's been learned in the last 10, 15 years, and of course, Li Ping Chen uh, in the immunology group had a great deal to do with this, is that uh, the tumor makes a protein called PDL1 that's shown here in green, and uh, the, um, the, uh, the T cell has a receptor called PD1, programmed F1, and when these two interact, that actually results in inhibition. Uh, see that? That red, that's an inhibition. So it turns off the T cell after it's just been turned on. And then to make the situation worse is when the T cell activates, it makes gamma interferon. And gamma interferon through the STAT pathway actually stimulates the, uh, the, uh, the, the tumor cell to make more PDL1. So it's an adaptive process that upregulates itself. So what am I saying? That basically this is a rheostat that turns off the T cell. And in, in many ways, it's a good thing because we, for infections, for, for uh, you know, pneumonitis, you know, for inflammation in the thyroid, other areas, you want to turn things off. However, when you're targeting a tumor, this is a, a way for the tumor to evade the immune system. So everything I'm going to tell you about today really tries to block this interaction. Now, if that's all there was, everything would be incredible. It's still incredible, but it could be even more incredible because other cells in the immune microenvironment are involved in this as well. And you can see they all interact with a T cell. So, and Yale is just such a hotbed of research in this area. But what are the macrophages doing? What are the helper T cells doing? What are the dendritic cells doing? And you can see all of them have receptors. Some of them have PDL1 as well. So, the way I look at it is this is a checkpoint in about 20 25% of patients. Blocking this is going to cause incredible results. I'll show you some examples in a moment. And uh, even in those patients, but in others, there might be other checkpoints in play, or we have to figure out what's happening in the rest of the immune microenvironment. It really works. Now, uh, many of you read these x-rays, but this is a patient from Scott Gettinger, and uh, uh, this is Maureen. Uh, she, this is seven and a half years now. Uh, she was at our lung cancer event uh, early March. She looks great. 63-year-old, uh, ex-smoker, 15-pack years, stage four squamous lung cancer, metastatic to multiple areas, three prior chemotherapies. She happened to come to Yale uh, in, 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 in 2010 and see Scott, and he had a phase one trial of MDX1107, and after reading the consent, she decided to go on. She met the qualifications, and her large cancer, um, metastatic in multiple areas, responded very quickly and has remained uh, in almost a complete response now seven years later. So this patient is the one you see on the commercial on TV. These are the patients... The, probably one out of 10, maybe even one out of 15 or 20, who just have the amazing response. And I dare I say it, that they could be, um, they could be cured uh, from their lung cancer. So this, this is amazing. I'll say that we don't see this that often, but we do see about 15, 20% of patients with long-term benefit on the immunotherapies, patients who are smokers, patients who don't have the addicted drivers. So it really is paradigm shifting. And then from a research point of view, the other 80% how to help them do better that really is its the perfect storm of research because patients are benefiting. We have interesting trials, but now using science. And the only way we're going to bring science in is if we have tissue. That's, that, that's the challenge, and that's what I want to emphasize today. Scott uh, was very involved in all this work in that phase one trial. Refractory lung cancer patients are living two years uh, with 24% uh, and three years, 18%. The thing that's interesting is this tail of the curve, the fact that you're seeing long-term survivors. And I would actually can test that for the patients who benefit from immunotherapy, they'll do even better than those who get targeted therapy because the resistance doesn't develop as quickly or at all. 
because the immune system is adaptive, the immune system is specific, and uh, you know, we, we, we don't see resistance at the same level. Though it does, it does occur. Now there are two ways to block this. You can either block uh, PD-1 or PD-L1. I told you the T cell had this PD-1 on the surface, right? So there are two ways to do it. You can have an antibody against uh, uh, PD-1. So here's the PD-1 on the T cell. So that blocks PD-1 here, and that keeps PD-1 from interacting with a tumor cell, PD-L1. Uh, you also get PD-L2 at the same time. Um, many think that that's bad, that PD-L2 is involved in normal immune reg regulation. Um, but nonetheless, these are the agents that have been uh, most studied. Uh, these are the agents that came down the pike first. It also leaves this interaction uh, free, and there, there is some thought that blocking this might be better. So what happens is, you know, there's a lot of diversity in drug development and free, free spirit and competition. So a number of groups are developing pd one agents, so they target this side of the equation. Again, still blocking the PD-1, pd one interaction, but now they block this pd one B7-1 interaction. So that, that, that's thought to be more potent, and then at least pd 2 sort of free for normal immune response. So uh, is one better than the other? Uh, the data are still emerging. It's not clear that there is much difference. Some have even suggested use the two together. We're actually studying this in the lab with Li Ping, because perhaps if we use both together, we'll have an even more complete blockage of this axis. There are toxicities. So this is, this is important, and many of you see this uh, first. Um, the most common toxicity is probably, uh, and, 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 and least, uh, least uh, uh, harmful, because we can usually treat it, are the endocrinopathies. Uh, hypothyroidism is actually quite common. Um, you know, I've, I've spoken to the internal medicine group here on this. You get, need to think about it. You need to, if someone comes in, we, they, they seem uh, tired, fatigued, um, check thyroid function, uh, cortisol levels. You know, we've seen some hypopituitary patients. Uh, very, very, very important to keep an eye for that. Pneumonitis, of course, especially in lung cancer patients, you know, you can see uh, pneumonitis. Um, you know, uh, some of you have been working with Scott on this and others, you know, how to manage this. The good thing is we've learned to, to look for it. It's only severe, grade three or four, about 5% of the time, and, and usually steroids uh, help uh, very early on. Colitis and gastrointestinal issues. We've seen some uh, pretty incredible neuropathies in some patients, especially in some of the small cell patients who are already prone to have some paraneoplastic syndromes. Ocular, ocular issues, cardiac, I'll show you a picture, dermatologic, hepatic, renal. So you have to think anything that has itis in it can probably occur Again, it makes sense because you're unblocking the immune system both in the tumor, as I showed you, but the same thing can happen in the immune microenvironment. Are those mechanisms the same? We don't quite know yet, and that's actually something that I think Yale is very well equipped to study. So here's a little bit about the pneumonitis, and um, actually there's, there's a paper, I, Scott might have already submitted it, that I'm sure some of you are working with him on to just sort of characterize these cases. How do you treat it? When do you re-challenge? Um, you know, we're, we're very fortunate here. We're very... Uh, our pulmonary group uh, is very good and, 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 and likes to, to help us with the biopsies and, and the bronchoscopies. So how do you characterize pneumonitis and, and when do you treat and not to treat? That, that's something we're trying to work out. Also, this is a, a very, the most severe case I've seen of, of, of pericarditis. And obviously, this didn't end too well because this is a, an autopsy specimen. But this was a man who was having an amazing response to immune therapy, just the most amazing response. Uh, you know, it was a delayed response. It had taken him about two or three months to respond. He was on one of our clinical trials. I was actually treating him, uh, but then he, his performance status improved to 100%. His tumors had nearly completely um, uh, resolved, but then he, he came in one night short of breath, and uh, we, 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 we couldn't uh, uh, resuscitate him after he had a, an arrest on the floor, and, you know, he had typical bread and butter pericarditis on uh, someone who's responding. So these are very powerful agents. That's why it's important to know in whom they're working, use them in the right patients, and in other patients figure th other things out. This works to the brain. This is work of Sarah Goldberg and, um, and Harriet Kluger and, and Veronica Chang. For patients with small brain metastases, we're now using the immunotherapies uh, without treating with uh, cranial irradiation, which can have a large amount of comorbidity. And you can see very nice responses. We're seeing responses in the brain about 50% of the time at about the same rate uh, in this selected group of patients that we're seeing response to the uh, periphery. Is pd one a biomarker? So the question would be, um, can we use pd one as a biomarker? Can we, can we measure the pd one The problem is that this is in tissue, so it's quite heterogeneous. Um, many times the biopsy we get is uh, not uh, from 
when we're treating, but it might be from months earlier. So the question is, how, how useful is it? Is the biomer biopsy from a primary versus metastatic site? And how do we uh, score that biopsy? So I bring this up because biopsies are important, but there are all these complexities as to where we biopsy, heterogeneity. So I say, Richard here, uh, you know, imaging is going to be so important now. So if, you know, one of the things I unfortunately don't have any slides on this yet because I haven't gone to visit him recently, but I will. But if we, if we can image pd one I think that's going to be very exciting. The other thing is to look at pd one in, 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 in the blood and, and measure it there. But, but right now, I think we're doing a reasonable job just with biopsies. But uh, I think uh, imaging is going to be so important to this, uh, especially as patients go through the course of treatment. And then how do you define a positive result? Um, you know, is it 10% positivity, 30% positivity? Uh, where do you measure the location? I'll show you some examples. So this is from David Rim. Actually, uh, Joe McLaughlin, one of our fellows, did this with him and Kurt Schauper. We actually took a piece of lung tissue, uh, this is one piece of lung tissue, and stained for pd one with two different antibodies. And you can see here's one area that's stone cold negative, and one area that's, that's quite positive with two different uh, relative rates depending on the antibody you used. So I just show this to mention heterogeneity can be important. The way we sort of look at this right now is a positive result is usually uh, very meaningful. A negative result doesn't mean the patient might not, will not respond because you might have uh, missed the area. And again, hopefully imaging can help us, or image-guided biopsies perhaps. And then you can see that where do you measure it? So this is a double label where green's the cytokeratin, uh, blue are the nuclei, red is the, uh, the PD-L1. So you can see you can either measure it in the tumor or the stroma. That's going to be important to figure out. Um, so um, this is very interesting. So um, uh, what we've done is we've, we've worked very hard here at Yale and, and with collaborators to develop pd one as a biomarker. So this was a phase one study actually published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and Paul Ader from our phase one group was one of the authors. Uh, a large number of patients went on here, and these patients all had biopsies, and what was done is, this was a, an antibody known as 22C3, and the way this worked is patients were, were, were put on this trial, and then you could see they either have no staining, they either have high staining, more than 50%, or an intermediate group, 1 to 49%. And this was a phase one trial, so this is all retrospective, looking back on the trial. But it was pretty interesting. In those patients that had the high staining, more than 50%, here's the survival versus those that had uh, low or zero. So this suggested in this study that the biomarker could predict who would survive longer. And believe it or not, the FDA approved this drug based on this, uh, on this result. Now, um, I then led a trial, you know, uh, based on that biomarker, where we did a trial where we then stratified the patients prospectively. This resulted in the full approval of this drug uh, in the US and Europe and Asia now. Just uh, Asia is always a few years behind, but that's occurring now as well. Where we took patients who were either 50% or 1%. This is a large randomized trial, uh, almost 1,400 patients. And we used two doses of uh, the PD-1 inhibitor pembrolizumab. That's the Merck drug. And you can see here's chemotherapy, and here's the two doses of the, of the PD-1. So you can see in the high group, you can see the, the large difference. The hazard ratio here is 0.5. That's a, a phenomenal result in refractory lung cancer. And here's the hazard ratio 0.7, two doses versus chemotherapy control. You can see here, this is the 1% group. So it, it shows you the biomarker makes a difference. They both work, and they both improve for survival, and they should both be used. But with a higher biomarker result, the, the magnitude of the benefit is, is, is greater. And again, you need the fresh biopsy to do that. So then, uh, you know, um, we were involved at Yale, but this was, this was led out of Europe by Dr. Reck and colleagues. This is actually a very important trial in, in, in the field because now all patients are getting a biopsy, and you don't have to worry about whether it's old or new when it's new diagnosis lung cancer. So here's new diagnosis lung cancer, untreated. Um, all of them had to have the pd one greater than 50%, 305 patients. They screened, I should tell you, about 1,800 patients to get these 305 because the 50% group is only about 20%. And then they have to be healthy, and they can't have any pulmonary emboli, and they have to have a good performance status, uh, zero to one, and then remove all those patients with the EGFR and ALK, the, the, the activating mutations, and patients were randomized to immunotherapy versus chemotherapy. And then for those who had chemotherapy, they crossed over to the immunotherapy. So this trial uh, actually was reported just last October. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival. The secondary endpoint was overall survival and response. And, and here's the result. 
And um, uh, you know, this is a 45% response rate for immunotherapy, no chemotherapy in untreated lung cancer. Really, this is incredible to think that now lung cancer in 20 to 25% of the patients is treated without chemotherapy in the frontline setting. This is chemotherapy, about a 28% response rate. These, these little hashed lines here, those are complete responders. So this is, this is actually very compelling data. And then if you look at progression-free survival, the hazard ratio here is 0 0.5. This is the uh, immunotherapy pembrolizumab versus the control. So what's the bottom line here? Uh, this resulted in this drug being approved in the 20 to 25% of patients who have um, uh, PD-L1 positivity above 50%, they're now getting immunotherapy frontline. And then the survival, which was a secondary endpoint, was also quite, quite positive. This is a bit of an early survival curve, as most of you can see, because you know, here's 12 months and there are many patients still censored, meaning that they haven't, they haven't gone, gone through and, and we need more mature data. But nonetheless, you know, at one year, 70% of patients are alive uh, who got the pembrolizumab first versus 54 who got the control. Uh, and remember, this group crossed over, so that's why it might look good, but the hazard ratio is 0 0.6. So immunotherapy now has made it to the front line. However, even though the response rate here is 45%. The question we have to ask is, what about the other 55%? Why are they not responding? They might be the patients I mentioned that have the regulatory cells or the inhibitory cells in the microenvironment. And only through biopsies and, and analysis, maybe functional analysis as well, will we figure that out. Just to show you that it's not so simple, this is, and for those of you who follow this uh, closely, this is the, and I'm actually speaking later today to the Yale Innovation Summit on uh, in the business school, so everyone's going to want to know about the different companies that are involved in all this. So this is the, that was the Merck trial. This is the very similar trial from uh, Nivolumab with Bristol-Myers. And here you can see patients with stage 4 recurrent non-smosal lung cancer, no prior systemic therapy for advanced disease. So very similar trial. But instead of taking patients only at the high biomarker level, they, they, they got a little bit more aggressive, maybe, you know, a little greedy, one would say, and they took patients above 1%. And why would you want 1%? Because the, now you have 70, 80% of the patients, not just 20%, a larger population. But I don't think their data were quite as strong. And uh, they also allowed patients with brain metastases on the trial, which meant that they had a bit of a, uh, by definition, of a sicker population. And they gave nivolumab, which is another PD-1 inhibitor versus chemotherapy. And their result looks like this. This is their PFS curve. And as you look at this carefully, the green is actually the control chemotherapy. So when you don't use the biomarker, you don't see any benefit at all. In fact, you might even say that you're better off giving the chemotherapy versus the immunotherapy. So that's the moral of the story here. Tissue matters, biopsies matter, and, and um, that might not have been the only, only factor here, but I think it's the most significant that they selected it a little differently. So just the last thing I'll show you before I get into the, the spore work we're doing in the last five minutes, ten minutes, is this study, is gonna re this study was a very significant study because one thing that's, that's happening is here at Yale, we can get the biopsies, we can get the tissue. Around the country, that's not so easy still. You know, adopting uh, PD-L1 testing, biopsies is still only in the 30, 40% range. So one thought would be, what about if you gave chemotherapy, here's uh, carboplatin pemetrexate chemotherapy with pembrolizumab versus chemotherapy alone. And this is a trial known as Keynote 21. It's only 123 patients, but these were untreated lung cancer patients. No one worried about their PD-L1 status. Everyone could go on, um, and then retrospectively, patients were reviewed uh, for their biomarker. And the reason I show you this is here's progression-free survival, and the hazard ratio was 0.53. This is pembrolizumab chemotherapy versus chemotherapy alone. In the overall survival range, there's no difference between the two arms. It's early data, and it was crossed over, but both arms are in the 70% range. This is very controversial right now. Uh, because academically, one would say this is only a phase two trial. Where's the phase three? Um, but from a practical point of view, many people are looking at this trial and saying, well, you give chemotherapy and immunotherapy, and hopefully you're getting the message from me that the only chance in, an un, uh, in a non-addicted lung cancer with a mutation for long-term survival is to get a, one of these immune therapies. You know, chemotherapy is not going to do it. So many people are saying, well, why not just give the combination up front? Uh, the toxicity was not that much increased by putting the two together. It was, it was additive, not synergistic. So the reason I show you this is the FDA is set to rule on this uh, Thursday, tomorrow. So this will be in the news either yes or no, uh, whether this gets approved uh, as a combination 
my personal opinion is we need more data. We need a, a larger phase three trial. However, I can tell you in the busy clinic and the fact that you can give both drugs to patients, and we know many patients who get chemotherapy don't survive long enough to get the immune therapy, there could be something to this. So stay tuned to what you'll hear in the news in the next 24 hours. And then this is very interesting. So here's pembrolizumab plus chemotherapy. Here's patients completely negative. Again, it's small numbers, 21 patients, but 57% response rate. So the problem here is it's early small numbers, but it's quite compelling that the combination is certainly better than chemotherapy alone. So finally, um, I don't want to go over time. This is an exciting field. You can sense my excitement, my team's excitement. We, we're really working on team science. Many of you are part of our team. In fact, I see so many people here who have worked with us. And that's really where, what we're trying to do. Uh, I head the Office of Translational Research in the Cancer Center. And the goal is to bring teams together. And radiology is just such a vital part of that. And you know, since Kevin's been here, I've been enjoyed working with him. And Richard's part of our spore group. And Henry and others. And many of you we work with in the thoracic uh, program where I work. But, but really, the more we can collaborate, the better. And biopsies are key. So here's an example of, of how we do biopsies. Here, here are patients who, who have a large tumor. It responds to immunotherapy, but then it starts to grow again. And you ask what's going on, and you know, we can measure if we re-biopsy CD8. We can measure T cells, killer T cells. We can look at the H and E. And if we do re-biopsy sometimes, even though we see tumor growing, we see that really what we have is necrosis. So re-biopsies in many cases are going to be so critical. We've done a study, this is um, uh, work from a couple of years ago, uh, working with a, a drug called MPDL3280 or tezeluzumab, where we got biopsies on 30 patients pre and post, not just here at Yale, it was done at eight other sites around the country, but we actually found that the PDL1 was not only on the tumor cells, shown here, double labeled with CK, but also on T cells, macrophages, and dendritic cells. And then what we did is, if we can use biopsies, what we can do is we can not only measure the T cells uh, or the CD8 cells, whether they're there or not, but we can do uh, gene expression platforms to ask what's the quality of those T cells. So what we actually did is, here's a patient with a very nice response to the immunotherapy. You can see very nicely, you can see the CD8 cells before and after. So T cells came to, to the tumor. So it's, it's a two-part process. You need to have T cells infusing into the tumor. But then we actually saw that functionally these T cells were quite active. Here's pre and post, and you can see pre, post. This is granzyme A and B, so granzyme going up, perforin goes up. Perforin is the enzyme that actually pokes the hole in the cell to cause it to die or apoptose. Um, you, know, you can see tumor necrosis factor. So this is what happens in, in the active response. However, when you do these biopsies, you can also see that many patients don't respond. And when we asked why do patients not respond, we looked and we saw that in patients that don't respond, here's pre and post biopsies, you don't see any brown, you don't see any T cells in the tumor. So here's a tumor that had no T cell infiltration. Some would say it's not inflamed, and then nothing happened after treatment. And here's one where there's a little bit of uh, inflammation and a little bit more happened after treatment, but not enough to be functional. And actually, this is very interesting, a situation where you see some T cell infiltrate. Post treatment, you do see a proliferation of T cells, but they're not getting through to the tumor. And all these biopsies are helping us to figure out the mechanism because combinations are going to be based on this. I'm going to skip a few. So in the last minute, we have a very active group, uh, a lung spore group, that's really trying to study this. Um, and uh, for this project, here are some of the, the, the lead investigators. We're studying uh, immunotherapy through this large NCI grant, trying to understand the mechanisms of sensitivity and resistance. We're working with Li Ping Chen, and um, for those who are familiar with his work, we, we classify tumors into types 1, 2, 3, and 4. Most of what I've told you today about what we call the type 2 tumors, the tumors that here's double labeling with PDL1 uh, in blue, uh, in, in, in brown, excuse me, in till in blue, where you have uh, large numbers of T cells in the tumors and, and large amount of PDL1. But we also know that a large number of lung cancers um, have plenty of till but no PDL1. So we're looking for other checkpoints. We also know that a large number of tumors um, don't have any, any tills at all. You can see here the immune microenvironment is, is pretty barren. So I'm going to uh, end here and just tell you that it's been quite an evolution in lung cancer. We've, we've moved um, uh, from an era where uh, if you had lung cancer, it was chemotherapy and really very little chance of long-term cure uh, or, or survival to an era of targeted therapy. 
Uh, still working on the targets. I think targeted therapy is going to be important. We need to identify the targets, and interventional radiology is critical for that. It's become standard around the country, as I'm sure you've known. I've spoken to the society a few times over the years about these types of things. And now, of course, immunotherapy. And my, my thesis, the, the, well, my fourth point was that really the idea is now immunotherapy has to become personalized therapy, and we're going to need biopsies there. We're going to have to think about the biopsies that we get because we need tumor and stroma as well. So it's really you know, an exciting time to be uh, treating patients. I'll just go to my last slide. I was a little ambitious this morning. We, this, is, this is our SPORE team. And, and uh, way too many slides, huh? I talk slow. And, and, and this is our team. Thank you very much.